I'm Subhashish. Um, I grew up in Mumbai, but right now working and based out of Singapore. Um, I represent a company called Symphony, and uh, we are uh, active in Singapore, in India, where we are scaling up, and as well as in the United States. So that's uh, you know uh, just a quick context. Uh, the reason I'm here is because uh, we explored a lot of ways of trying to address that part of the population um, who are very slow in responding, right? And because of various reasons. And today I hope uh, I can walk you through a little bit of that. You will realize hopefully by the end of this talk that there is an enormous opportunity in this space for game developers, for gaming enthusiasts, and, and for people uh, who are in this space to actually contribute. Uh, a lot of people are working on this as well. And it's a, it's a little different in my experience. So today, I don't claim to be a gaming expert, but today I will just walk you through what we did. Uh, and I would love to get your interactions on what we did right and what we did wrong. Uh, one of the uh, hopes I have in today's talk is to go back with a lot of ideas from you guys, which can immediately start impacting uh, the people we work with. So I hope that happens. So I'm going to share my screen now. Can you hear me now? Yes. So, so we are live? Yeah, okay. okay. So let me know if you can hear and see. Is that good? Hello? We're good. Yes, uh, we can we can hear you and see you. So, yeah. okay, because okay. I'm not getting any feedback at all. So, yeah, yeah. That just, is fine. Uh, yeah, this was fine. This was fine just yes. now? Hmm? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so back to square one. <laughs> so in case you didn't hear what I was saying, um, today's topic is healing the damaged brain, the other side of gaming. And you will find that uh, what works in this space is uh, sometimes surprising, uh, sometimes a little different compared to what all you guys may be used to. Uh, my journey, as Madhulika explained, uh, started many years ago. Uh, when I was running a technology business, I ended up as a brain injury patient arising out of an accident and then spent the next three years trying to overcome disability, which were both cognitive as well as physical. Uh, after that, I spent five years practicing as a therapist. And one of the reasons was to give me the chance to recover completely and get back, you know, fully on my feet uh, as a fully functional uh, professional. Uh, by that time, my interest turned towards therapy, and uh, I came to Singapore in 2007 to do the early stages of clinical research uh, on how technology could assist and help brain injury patients like myself recover uh, without spending eight years, right? Um, this was also the time I was introduced to the movement arts um, through Tai Chi, and both the clinical research and movement actually showed me that the body, the physical body is actually an amazing tool to heal the human mind. Okay. And then that's then we took that approach. And when I come to the wearables, you will see that uh, we have a body wearable and we have a brain wearable. Uh, it has been seven years since we started Symphony as a company. Uh, so I'm back to the technology business, uh, which is amazing. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, a little more of what Symphony is will appear in the following slides.
So what were my learnings from this journey? Um, when, when I had brain damage, uh, obviously, you know, the doctors do assessments, etc. So they told me that my IQ has gone below 70. And then that's pretty much, you know, um, in the area where one is really non-functional when it comes to doing what adults do. And naturally, because I had a lot of physical damage as well. I had to relearn how to walk, which is, you know, very physical, as well as how to think, uh, which is very invisible, right? People don't realize what's going through, what are the difficulties you're having inside your head and how that affects everything that you do, you know? So it's as if the entire personality changes. But then the brain is such an amazing thing that post a few years, I could actually enter into a PhD program and successfully complete it. And for, you know, most of you may have a pretty good idea of how demanding a five-year PhD program is. And then I returned to full-time work, which means, you know, doing the traveling I used to, uh, crisscrossing time zones and, you know, doing 80-hour weeks and then stuff like that. So, the key learning was that no matter where you are on this brain damage spectrum, uh, there is that window and there is that navigation pathway, which if you tread properly and in a very deliberate manner, you can really emerge out um, completely back to being independent and, and normal. And as far as I was concerned, I emerged out even ahead of where I was before because Previously, I had never thought in my life that, you know, I would be able to actually undertake and do a PhD. So, so this was really um, an insight for me. And over the past few years in Symphony, we've seen that this not only works in cases like what I went through, but also in the cases of stroke, dementia, Parkinson's, dyslexia, attention deficit disorder, motor neuron disease, and a few more. And... If any of you are familiar with these uh, diseases, you will know that all of them involve a real mess up in how the brain and the muscle work together, right? Um, during this time, uh, another thing became very obvious, and that is normal people, in normal people, the brain and muscle support each other whenever we are trying to do something, even if it's a simple task or it's a demanding task. Whereas when you're in this space where, uh, you know, in this disease space, or in this disability space, it is almost without exception that the brain and body are always sabotaging each other, right? It's as if this disease or this injury sort of made them enemies from friends, right? And the journey that we, we our technology does is, you know, to get them to shake hands and be friends again. And, and, and that's what, uh, what I will show you in the subsequent slides, in a small video. We'll show you, you know, how, how we are using uh, technology to do this. So I'll move into a slide which is maybe um, explaining what I experienced and what I was forced to do or what I was trying to do during those eight years. And I hope, you know, um, I will be able to uh, get some feedback and, you know, uh, from you guys. Uh, as we as we move through these slides. So the only things that I could do were very low demand training, which means that something typically would maybe a three-year-old or a four-year-old could do, right? When it came to tasks, right? So to give you a sense, I couldn't remember anything beyond four digits. Uh, I couldn't really complete any task which had more than four steps or three steps uh, and, and so on, right? Um, then I had very low fatigue tolerance, which means if I start trying to do something, fatigue would kick in within the first five minutes, right? To such an extent that I needed a 15 minute break before I could try it again. I talked to you about the low IQ thing, uh, which was uh, had its own issues. Uh, then visual and audio processing issues, which means when you see something and you hear something, you could understand what it is, but to react to that through your physical body would take you sometimes four minutes, five minutes or longer, 
right? Um, before it actually, the reaction actually manifested or came out. So everything was super slow and everything was super fatiguing. Uh, of course, perception varied. Uh, so your perception about your own self, your own body, and how you saw the situation outside, uh, you saw that in very twisted ways, right? For example, if somebody was trying to help you, uh, I would get angry. Um, uh, so we we always perceive threat and danger in a very, very amplified manner. Of course, very low attention span. Um, and I'll talk about that a little more when we when we go down that slide. Very slow movement, right? So in my head, although the movement was happening at its normal speed, the body was moving really, really slow, right? Um, uh, and and even when we try hard, the range of movement used to be very small. So very little movement. Uh, so sometimes, to give you a sense, if I was lying down and I had to get up and come to a sitting position. It would take sometimes two and a half to three minutes. And you can imagine how that entire process would have worked. So by the time I'm in sitting position, I am so fatigued, I want to lie down again. And there's no question of getting up and going to the toilet or sitting up and, you know, drinking your cup of water or whatever it is. And so motivation takes a very big hit. And the only things you really end up doing are those which have a lot of meaning to you or you need to do Absolutely, right? Like, for example, going to the toilet. Uh, and when I say meaning, it means, okay, uh, I need to spend a little time uh, playing with my daughter, who was at that time um, very young, uh, baby, actually. Uh, and so that actually uh, was a great motivator for me to do all these things, right? Try to pay attention, try to move, try to sit up, try to process. And all these other things which were which was so difficult. For most of the other tasks, I didn't care a damn. Uh, for all I care, I would have just been happy lying down on the bed and, uh, you know, looking at this. So why does this happen, right? And, you know, if, if any of you uh, have any thoughts or if you know or if you've taken care of a loved one, uh, the question is, why is everything so difficult and why is everything so slow? Right. Um, this was a big question to be answered before we thought of a solution. Uh, and over here, um, I don't know if you guys could, you know, actually uh, put it into the discussion box. Um, your thoughts. Uh, let me share uh, mine. Um, very low demand training um, happens because at the input level and the output level. Uh, it is very fatiguing to process anything, right? Uh, whether it's language, whether it's visual, uh, um, or, or whether it's instructions. Uh, and the short-term memory problem adds to it, right? Which means if I'm expected to do any training which expects me to remember what happened six or seven seconds ago, uh, that's a tall order, right? And because that processing is so time consuming and energy sapping, uh, naturally the fatigue hit very, very fast. Okay. And when you're fatigued and you can't process, you will invariably fail all your IQ tests. Okay. Uh, no matter uh, what's going on inside your head, uh, the tests, you will be hopeless at testing. So, so it was a problem of receiving inputs was a problem of executing outputs and it was a problem of processing and as we you know look at the human brain we find that we have two sides of the brain right the left and the right and if you're trying to even process and execute a simple task um, uh, the electrical activity in the brain crisscross uh, the 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 division between the two brains which we call the corpus callosum uh, hundreds of thousands of times um, in a few seconds, right? And when that cr crisscross stops or becomes sluggish, uh, that's when um, the body saps up all your energy, right? So the brain saps up all your body energy and uh, it takes a long time to actually move across and actually emerge as a reaction. 
all this uh, you know basically gets to a low attention span it gets to very slow movement it gets to very little movement and because of all this it gets to very little motivation so the first two points were very key points and when i realized that they were key points i did everything purposely really really slow in start instead of trying to you know do it at the speed that i remembered uh, doing it or doing it at the speed that i saw people around me doing it uh, and getting frustrated that it was not happening so when i decided that hey i am slow the turn around was almost immediate okay i could i still remember starkly that the time i took to get up and sit on the bed uh went down uh, by almost 50% within a week okay and this was the brain just accepting that look i need more time so don't rush me and if anybody asks me to do anything without feeling frustrated or embarrassed or anything i will take my time and that was a major uh, turning around process the low demand starting point and as i got used to that uh, i could actually recognize the brain responding and then i was able to move from a very low demand to the next higher low demand task and so on and so forth and that's when both at a brain level and at a muscle level i saw things changing around so when we look at gaming uh you know these are some of the things that a lay person like me recognizes right uh, the graphics get richer with every version with every new game that comes around uh, the computer space the real estate on the computer screen gets really crowded because there are many elements moving uh, there are faster and faster speeds of play and there is a lot of multi direction movements of components on the screen right uh, which leads to a really really uh, what shall i say challenge high level of challenge uh, for gamers and which they enjoy so there is a particular level of sensory load and cognitive load uh, and the more difficult ga- games have a higher sensory load and a higher cognitive load then i have seen gaming move to multiplayer environments and there they become really highly competitive and of course the systems have really really high computing power now when i look at what a person like me could handle a low demand low fatigue environment that demanded very bare basic graphics okay it required a lot of empty spaces on the computer screen because as you move from one component to other i the people with brain damage sometimes cannot make out a background from a foreground or if two items are close together they overlap so they can't make out the edges and hence it's really confusing and the brain really shuts down so a lot of bare spaces very slow speeds of play you know to accommodate the processing issues and the criss cross between left brain and right brain issues usually a person at a time can only either process an up and down kind of movement or a left to right movement diagonal movements are very difficult to process and other complicated things like circular movements and things like that are really really uh, difficult of course we have to constantly unload the sensory system otherwise people will get tired and overwhelmed very quickly so the idea is with a minimum input what can we get and the best thing that works is if i do whatever i am doing at a cognitive rest state which means i don't load myself cognitively right so one task at a time and a few things like that okay um then of course uh it's only a single player because there's always a mismatch when you're doing it with a normal person and then a very different principle from gaming which is don't try your best don't try your best is uh not getting this guy lazy but keeping him within the boundaries of his processing power well within his boundaries of his processing power and every time they try their best they induce muscle tension and the processing in the brain goes crazy right so to get used to operating within 
uh, a different environment which is very very low demand and then of course because we were trying to build a technology which people could take home as part of a wearable our trip was to get all this done with as low computing power as possible okay so when you look at the left and right you will see they are dramatically different and that's why you know the title i call it the other side and as we go forward you'll see that this other side is actually just as fascinating so i'm going to show you a small video and you'll see what the interface looks like and again uh, at the end of the talk because i still can't you know see the discussion button on this platform and hence i can't see your questions uh, it would be great if we could answer questions at the end or if madhulika can help out uh, pushing out some questions to me that will also be great so after this video gets over uh, if any of you have any comments questions etc i'd love that to come so here goes hi today i'm going to introduce you to the symphony device symphony is an abbreviation for synergistic physio neuro platform and this platform actually helps one to train brain and muscle together as one system what it does is it captures brain and muscle signals uses that to provide feedback in real time on various metrics in particular brain and muscle responses in real time while somebody is attempting to do a task So let me just show you how this works. This is a set of sensors. We call this the headgear, and this is very easy to put on. And then this is the arm gear, which is very quick to put on and set up. What you see here is a charging dock. It does both wirelessly charge the two devices as well as it generates its own Wi-Fi network, so that we are not dependent on the Wi-Fi network of the local machine. When we go to the user interface, there are two sections. One allows you to train, one allows you to do rehab. Once we choose any one muscle that we want to work with, this provides a very simple interface of a tree with two bears. The bears actually denote the muscles we wish to use and we wish not to use. This allows the patient to do what we call self-correction, which means enhance the good responses at a brain and muscle level. and subdue those which are maladaptive and which in a large number of cases are unconscious you see a smiley over here it's an icon when that icon is smiling we know that i am in the ideal learning state so in a learning zone when i do the exercises uh, the hypothesis is that we wire the brain the fastest and in our clinical trials we've seen that we need as few as five repetitions of an exercise in order for people to undo compensation and start a recovery journey from here we go to the actual therapy interface this gives you the option to actually give feedback on on various issues prior to the therapy session and then it guides you through whether you've placed the device correctly on your body and then it takes you through a relaxation protocol once we finish the relaxation uh, and the calibration we come to the user interface where the recommended exercises for you are already installed and once you take the device home all you have to do is then start it gives a reminder of how one must position oneself while doing therapy and we come back to the same interface that you saw before so let's do some therapy all the way and So I'm sharing again, so that you can hear me now. So, uh, 
Uh, before we go to this particular slide, um, yeah, the previous slide, uh, if there are any comments or questions about how the system works, uh, I can't see the chat box because I'm sharing the screen. Uh, so if any, any Madhulika wants to uh, send something, uh, articulate something, I'd be happy to answer. Otherwise, we'll move on. Uh, there was actually a question um, by Shira. Sure. Uh, so, Vashish, if you could just check your discuss panel. Um, the question should have come up over there. Um, basically, the question was, does the brain state analysis use alpha, beta, theta wave measurement? Okay. So, if you can hear me, uh, answer is yes, but it's only one of the measures. One of the big measures we actually use is left-right brain symmetry. Uh, so um, left-right brain symmetry is actually what enables a very quick left-to-right and right-to-left exchange uh, of activity. Uh, when it comes to front and back, uh, we try and maximize uh, relaxation at the back of the head. So we try and maximize alpha at the back of the head. But unlike traditional systems which use beta to denote attention, we actually use the inverse of delta. Now, and that has happened because, again, we found traditional beta training is actually very fatiguing, whereas the inverse of delta training actually enables much better processing. So, so that's the answer uh, to this question. Thanks for that. So I have another question here earlier on in the talk. Uh, you were mentioning the diseases that the technology has been shown to benefit. I couldn't help but notice that these are all relatively late onset uh, motor. Uh, one second. Let me just go back to the question. Yeah. With the exception of ADHD. Keeping this in mind, I wanted to know whether symphony has been tested in the treatment of motor or attention deficit disorders that present from birth. Yes, answer is yes. In short, I won't go into too much details. So ADD, attention deficit uh, disorder, dyslexia, uh, hyperactivity disorder, hypoactivity disorder. These are the ones that we are treating with apart from uh, difficulties arising from cerebral palsy. For example, if somebody has had a stroke in the womb or was uh, oxygen de deprived during birthing, uh, they also present with uh, a lot of uh, developmental delay, and that is another area where uh, we have done some work. Could the principles you mentioned uh, be used to create game on another platform, say mobile game? Great question. Uh, one of the things we find is the real estate. Okay, so high functioning patients, maybe who have moved from severe to moderate mild in their recovery cycle, uh, the mobile plat, the mobile screen is, is a, a, a very good environment for doing further training. But when it is severe, the real estate of a mobile screen is right now too small and we find people fatigue too quickly. And some of them just can't process elements uh, uh, on a screen of that size. So, so our standard uh, screen size configuration is 14 inch. That's the minimum. But the moment you become a high functioning patient, which means you move into the high moderate to mild range, uh, could pretty much very quickly switch to mobile. Another question, does this cater to specific brain injuries or do you also address people with severe injury, no motor control? Answer is yes. Uh, because what I, what I shared earlier was that when we work with motor control, even if it is like five degrees of motion and things like that, because we sense motor activity, it's an amazing tool to start healing how the mind processes various inputs, right? And so in many cases where the person is not cognitive, which means if you ask him something, he does not respond, he keeps staring at you. We start with motor training, right? Which means that even if the hand is not moving, we are able to detect millivolts of firing in the motor units. And then while we talk to the patient or we communicate with the patient, we see whether the patient is responding at that millivolt level, right? And then as millivolt, as millivolt becomes uh, 10 millivolts, 100 millivolts, 600 millivolts, 
you will find the person beginning to respond even cognitively. So he will probably be able to respond with the eye blink or something like that. So the two is, you know, I consider cognition and movement as the same thing, like two sides of the same coin, because they just seem so tightly dependent on each other. So what were the thoughts behind choosing the mechanics and themes of these games? That is a long, <laughs> that is a long thing, but very simple uh, to just put it a few points. Uh, we needed to give a maximum of three elements or four elements, like I mentioned, because that's all that is possible. Then we needed to create those huge open spaces between them. So whatever was on the left side had to be across the midline on the left. Whatever was on the right side had to be across the midline on the right so that they could very quickly differentiate what was happening where. And uh, of course, as you can mention over there, there's almost no text or anything. What you can see over there, there is no scoring, which is very important because we don't want to create a arousal. And then so on and so forth. There are a lot of things like that. Uh, if you go to the website uh, www.symphony.org, you will find uh, some of some of these principles and some of the papers around that. If you if you are interested. Another question quickly: What neurological and learning principles would you say consciously used in designing? Okay, I, I tackled that. Does it help people who didn't go physical damage but some mental damage and are now facing, facing difficulty to concentrate? Absolutely. Absolutely. But let me just tell you, you'll be amazed by doing movement exercises, how these concentration difficulties are ameliorated. We are seeing that as kids or teenagers or young adults start recruiting muscle and seeing and be able to manipulate the recruitment of muscle, their reading ability, concent I mean, uh, comprehension ability and math ability undergoes a change. So this is the frontier of neuroscience right now, where we are seeing that the body is the best tool to heal the brain and not necessarily the brain itself. Okay, so that was a great set of questions. Uh, thanks, everyone. Uh, I'm going to go back to the slide deck now. Um, let me see. Can you guys still see my screen? Give me a minute. I think because that's working the best. Okay, back to where we were. And now trying to link my novice understanding of gaming uh, to what you guys do, right? So I, I, I am aware that there are some principles that gaming follows. Uh, and of course, there are more, but uh, from my, from my uh, uh, whatever I know, I, these are some of the primary ones. And so when it comes to what we do, uh, we know that there are two types of problems um, that in gaming, we get the guy to solve so that he gets a score um, or he gets some kind of a reward. One is more general, which may have to do with managing the background, or creating an environment, etc. And other is more specific, right? So for example, a typical game would be if you want to do a driving game, but in a very relaxed state, the relaxed state would dictate that if you have a beautiful landscape as a background and 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 the uh, the concentration would make sure that the the car moves the fastest, right? So both general and specific. So that's one thing we do. And let me tell you what that means. The general in this case is the smiley face that you saw, right? Which tells the patient that I am focused and I am relaxed. And the specific problems is move one bear up while keeping the other down and then do the reverse with the second bear, right? So when we combine this, it affects both what we call state and trait, number one. Also, it starts getting people to do what we call dual task. So maintain a context while executing a task, right? Or improve a small short-term memory step while executing a start and so on and so forth. Then when it comes to objectives, uh, we have two objectives. The first screen you saw, which didn't have that video running on the left side, that was what we call exploratory learning, right? And over there, when patient asks us, so what do you want me to do? I said, move the bears. 
and keep the smiley face smiling. And they say, how do I do that? I said, I don't know, figure it out. And this is exactly what the instructions we give to them. And so they do all kinds of things. They move their hands, they move their body, they adjust their posture, uh, they lie down, they sit up, they try to do whatever they want. And suddenly they see these movements taking place. They start seeing that they are able to maintain the smiley, maybe three or four seconds longer than what they usually do. And that's where the sense of body and the sense of concentration comes, begins to re-emerge, right? Uh, people start feeling, yeah, I didn't, okay, all this time I wasn't feeling my right elbow or my right thumb, and now I can feel it again. And once this sense of self starts emerging, you can take them to tasks which are sequential, which require short-term memory and stuff like that. So, so that's moving from exploratory learning to goal-based learning. Constraints, right? You saw without constraint and with constraint. And I'll show you that uh, on a small video later. Success criteria, we have two. One is, of course, the way you guys define it, where as the games change, the success criteria changes. So we do have that. But there is one single criteria that never changes, irrespective of what kind of activity they are training on, whether it's just to open the hand or whether it's learning to play the guitar, right? Because that's the whole spectrum of uh, fine motor uh, excellence that our patients achieve. Uh, and over there, there is one cardinal rule, right? You have to move the right bear with those movements and you have to keep the face smiling. So I don't care if you're pay playing that musical piece really well, you can't go to the next complex level unless you establish these three, these two things. So they practice with lesser and lesser and lesser effort until they hit those metrics, which means that they can keep the smiley face smiling while paying, playing a two minute tune on the guitar. Plus when they are strumming, they are using the appropriate muscle only without using a whole set of other mishmash muscles. So, so when that happens, we know, okay, go to the next stage. So then they will do a five minute piece, a five minute piece. Then they will do it standing up and then they will do it in front of an audience and then they will go on stage. And at every stage that smiley face and bear remains their uh, success criteria, right? Of course, needless to say, by the time he's on stage, he doesn't need the device and he doesn't need this. Uh, he's pretty much on his own. Then when it comes to reward, our thing is to stay attached to purpose. And hence you see over here, there's no calculation of reward because the purpose is keep the face smiling uh, no matter whether you're succeeding in following the video or not, right? So the purpose is relaxation because relaxation maintains left-right symmetry uh, and relaxation... Uh, sort of makes them last longer. So it includes how long they can actually execute tasks. So as you can see, it's again going in the opposite direction. When we say play in the standard gaming over here, the play actually restores a sense of self, which is something that is of critical importance before he even starts to do things that resemble what you and I do, right? And when it comes to compete, uh, we work in the opposite direction. We immediately say, don't try your best. Uh, see what you can do without trying your best. Because then when you go to the next level, again, you don't try your best. So it makes this whole process really energy efficient. So you end up doing the same tasks, but with lesser and lesser and lesser effort. And once the fatigue is gone, uh, the learning happens really fast. The processing happens really fast. And that's when we can hit them with some really high demand tasks, um, you know, um, for short periods of time, say for a minute or a minute and a half uh, and moving forward all the way to a full one hour of training, right? As, as we usually do. Okay, so that's what we call the seven principles of infant learning, right? And it's quite amazing how closely this, both of these things are. Uh, and it's probably also the reason why infants learn through games really well. And if you look up, if any of you guys are from the biology side or the pediatric side, you will know that uh, these seven are also ways in which how uh, human beings learn in the first six to seven months after they are born, right? That's how babies learn. And what Symphony does basically in adults is that, uh, or, or in uh, teenagers or uh, say 10 year olds is, reboot how this person learned as a baby, right? 
using that user interface. And once we put them in that space, we find that uh, you know all these abilities beginning to reemerge. So yeah, so this was a little heavy, but now I will just share very simply um, some some cases and video, and I don't need the audio over here. So if you can see, this is a 42 year old male. He came to us five years after he had uh, a stroke and he was affected on the left side. And he came to us with a very specific goal. So his son was going to have a threat ceremony and he wanted to do the ritual. And so we asked him, what is it you need to do? And this is what you will see. Uh, so we started with him trying to just grip something like a spoon and be able to manipulate uh, some of these uh, very tiny objects and then go back to rest. And you can see he's trying to follow the speed on the video, right? Uh, and, and, and just follow that. So people end up slowing down. And as you know, if you have a hand that you can't lift up, the slow is really tough to do. So this is where he emerged in about one and a half months. Okay. You can see right now he doesn't need that wearable. You can see that he is manipulating water. Uh, you can see he is manipulating a bi-manual task, which means he's coordinating left and right hand. And you can see his wrist has opened up, his grip is strong, and so on and so forth. So this is one example. The other is a very, really old person, had a stroke 10 years ago. And I'm just focusing on stroke here. Uh, goal was to be able to write with his right hand again. So imagine a 79-year-old who has not done it for 10 years. I mean, hats off to some of these guys who are so motivated even after so long. Uh, so that was how he wrote. And uh, in the 20th session, which means, you know, just a few days later, uh, uh, this this is what uh, what he did. Uh, and he this is what we call constraint-based uh, exercise, right? So you have the lines to guide him and you have a tracing within which he has to execute this figure of eight. But then this is the same person uh, executing a constraint-free writing, right? And this he came to within a 30th session. So, so now he doesn't need any visual cues. Uh, his letters are almost same in height and width. You can see his grip. Uh, he's able to manipulate it depending on whether he wants to make a vertical stroke or a horizontal stroke. And he's also able to process and remember, okay, I'm writing the whole alphabet. So this person went from here to also doing some things he had never done before. And he saw one of the other patients using chopsticks. So he said, yeah, I'm a big fan of Chinese food, but I've never used chopsticks before. So this is him doing probably one of the most complex fine motor tasks that one can do, right? So this is worse than writing because writing at least allows you to stabilize the pen on the paper. Here, uh, you have no such luxury. You have to lift and you have to release. And so this is a good example of how people uh, overreach, right? Once they write, uh, learn the right things to do. This is a gentleman we met during COVID. So we have actually never met him face to face. Um, came to us in April saying that I'm pretty young. I want to get back to work. And he was a maths teacher. And he wanted to start at online classes because everything had moved online in the education area by then. And so this is what we did with him between April and June. And as you can see, uh, not only is he able to fully write, but he's able to write vertically uh, and with a chalk, which is, as you know, uh, a little more difficult than writing uh, horizontally with a pen on paper. So just wanted to share a few of these. Somebody asked the question of kids. This is one fantastic example. So this is a 13-year-old. And as you can see on the left side, uh, his writing was at age eight. Okay. We interacted with him for one and a half months um, overall, right? And what you see over here is just the results between 6th March and 23, 23rd March, which is about three weeks. So as you can see, uh, when you start going back and doing load, so we, we took him back to grade one writing, okay? Until he was able to manage the smiley and the bears. And then we rapidly brought him forward. And as you can see, not only uh, has handwriting changed, but even sentence construction, communication also changes. And that's why we see that when we teach him to handle muscle better, uh, cognitively also the person starts handling uh, things better. 
So this was a trial we did with 12 subject, 12 kids in South Africa. Uh, as you know, South Africa is unique because this is a whole lot of Zulu kids getting used to Cambridge education. And more than 50% of, of, of kids face uh, really, really severe uh, learning challenges and then the behavioral issues that come with these learning challenges, right? Like anger, frustration, violence, so on and so forth. So, so this is, you know, what we have done so far. If time permits, I'll show you a few others. But that's my talk, guys. Uh, we are symphony.com. And if any of, an, of you want to communicate with me, that's my email address. Yeah. So uh, let me now go back to and see if there's anything on the discussion board. Otherwise, Madhulika, all yours. We have about seven minutes to go. And Subhashi, so, there are a lot of questions. <laughs> you want to pick out any or you want me to scroll through? Uh, let me I see. I picked out a few so you can Please. just have a look yeah, at yeah. the audience. Yeah. 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 I'll yeah. just go back. Just a quick time check. Um, we have another eight minutes of uh, question and answers. So. Sure. Okay. So let me see what did I finish and what's here now. So I hope I've answered some of these questions with some reasonable degree of coherence and sim simplicity. Uh, what's the next step of development from here onwards and what do you see as the biggest challenge moving forward? Fabulous question, uh, Dev. Uh, I, I think so patients make a transition, right? They go from being really hopeless to getting better. And at some point of time, I've seen patients, wants, patients want to drive their own recovery. So one of the things we are trying to do here is because our system is capturing brain and muscle data in real time, whether to get signatures from there to determine whether they are ready for the next level of challenge in real time, and take them maybe to a different game in real time, right? Uh, because that can be tremendously exciting for a patient who's lived a long time without being able to really do something. And, and you know, sometimes um, what happens is um, we say, oh, yeah, you achieved the full score, so ready for level two, right? Uh, that would be something that, that we are looking at. Uh, but like I said, following those principles of low demand, until this person crosses the severe range and moves into mild to moderate. And then maybe, you know, transitioning to a full-fledged gaming platform, but at the corner of which the person can still moderate the smiley and the bears, right? So assume you have a regular game, uh, whichever are the popular games out there right now, and we could just plug in to that game and have a small window on the right side where he can self-regulate while he's playing the game and see if he can play it very effectively and at a, at, at, a, at a low fatigue level, right? So that's something really that's of great interest to us. And we want to work with uh, people in the industry uh, to, to get there. The other thing that we are trying to do similarly is say with the Xbox kind of platform, which uh, has a symphony sort of uh, electronics sitting on top of it. So that no matter what game you are playing, you always manage the smiley and the bears because what we are finding is whenever you operate within that zone, you're stress-free. So if you're a diabetic patient, you're a hypertensive patient, or you've had a stroke before, so you're at a risk of a second stroke, it keeps you safe. And um, a lot of times we've worked with very severe behavioral issues with professionals triggered by stress. And we've seen that they've been able to go back to a very high demand CEO and you know that kind of work in the banking, stock market areas, uh, even clinicians, some surgeons who've been able to go back because they've learned to operate in a zone which doesn't put them at risk. So, so these are some areas where uh, I think there are very exciting possibilities. Um, then one of the interesting things here is that scaffolding becomes very important to the experience. Yes. And that whereas games strive for arousal, here you want to prevent arousal. So I wouldn't say prevent arousal, um, uh, Srirang. I would say moderate arousal because a lot of times what happens is 
arousal happens unconsciously right something triggers it in a game uh, and say you fail repeatedly then it triggers the opposite thing and we don't want this yo yo right out of a gaming experience what we want is a environment where the arousal is happening but i'm moderating it so i am in charge uh, and that doesn't matter whether i'm because you know in daily life that's what happens right you go to the office you seal a deal everything is very high uh, by the time it's afternoon some problem has come up and everything has crashed and you don't have a deal and you know in 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 real life this is what happens and the best people who handle it are those who don't get hyper aroused and hypo aroused so so that's what that's what we are looking at so it's a moderation of arousal while yet retaining engagement yes absolutely and the use of intrinsic incentives helps excellent very very lovely language i will take away some of these words that you have used are the symphony sessions live if they aren't i was wondering how symphony deals with patients drop off great question yes they are live although i am not very clear uh, what do you mean uh, when it is live brinda but yeah so the patient is doing it and self correcting on the spot and they may be doing it by themselves with with no therapist around them so typically how we treat patients is out of every 10 sessions uh, we supervise one or two the rest the patient is left to do on their own and how does symphony deal with patient drop offs uh, drop off is very complex uh, there are many ways of uh, uh, you know dealing with it emotionally draining yes could lead to depressive episodes as well excellent question so when they see that they are taking charge of their recovery which means it is them that is making the bears move it is them that is making the smiley smile this actually is a great restoration of power if you may call it or control to the patient and we've seen that that's all the patient the motivation that the patients need because people with processing issues get they don't handle novelty very well which is why which is what you know in gaming normal people really love right if things are changing all the time these guys don't handle change very well so they like things to be stable as long as they see that now i was holding the smiley face for 10 seconds now it's become 15 seconds uh, that is where um, you know they stay or even come out of depressive episodes we've had a lot of people uh, who've gotten out of depress- depression because they feel they are in charge of their recovery um and and that's just been a natural progression we have not actually you know we don't separately have any kind of uh, protocol for depression or anything like that lastly um, so shubhashish sorry to jump yes. you yeah sorry to cut you out but thank no you problem. so much for this fantastic talk um there are so many fan- brilliant thoughts to go away with and 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 of course there are many more questions that are coming in so what we could do is um if you'd like to move to the lounge um you can continue talking to subhashish so okay. on the left hand side there's a lounge option um and um you can continue uh, having conversations with um the audience members over here so um this can continue uh, I- but just wanted to say thank you so much for uh, coming in and having you know this was incredibly impactful um like we said you know the games for change track or the applied games track is meant for interdisciplinary fields to come in together um and leverage the power of games towards social change and i think you're doing it so brilliantly especially seeing the um rehabilitation process of all these different stroke patients so thank you so much once again uh, thank just you very a much. quick all the best quick, for your other talks as well yeah please thank you uh just a quick thing uh we'd love to hear your feedback um so please have a look at the discuss tab and we have um posted a form it's a very short two question form we'd love to get your feedback because this is going to keep our content fresh and have wonderful speakers like shubhashish come in and um really create a change and make a difference so um please go ahead and fill that in and send it across to us um thank you so much shubhashish once again um manisha would you like to um come in the front stage Okay so we'll have um the next talk sh- shortly beginning in a couple of minutes so if you'd like to take a quick body break 
um, grab something to drink, come back. Um, the session will be starting shortly. Um, once again, thanks so much for all the likes. Um, this has been incredibly, uh, a very enthusiastic crowd, and we really want that as well for all our speakers. They hear they've, um, you know, they're also excited to come and speak to you all about the wonderful um, impact that they've been having. So um, hang on. Um, we'll be bringing on the next speaker very soon.